Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the opening session of our conference, Voting Matters Gender, Citizenship, and the Long 19th Amendment. This six part series is time to mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and to focus our attention on key moments in the complex history of gender and citizenship in the United States. It is fitting that we would begin today on Women's Equality Day, exactly 100 years after Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby signed the proclamation that officially certified the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But August 26, 1920 was not in fact the end of the suffrage struggle. The 19th Amendment did not immediately allow every American woman to vote and the fight to extend full citizenship rights to all Americans continues today. Nor was July 19th, 1848, the beginning. That was the first day of the Seneca Falls Convention organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others. But our distinguished speaker this afternoon, Martha Jones, will help us understand the origins of the suffrage movement and activism by African-American women during the 1830s. Efforts like this to explore the full complex history of suffrage lie at the heart of Radcliffe's long 19th Amendment project, which is led by my colleague, Jane Kaminsky, and supported by a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This lecture series is the public culmination of that ambitious and important undertaking. Jane will offer framing remarks and more formally introduce Martha Jones at just a moment. But before I hand off to Jane, I wanna take this opportunity to express my gratitude to her, to the entire Schlesinger Library staff, and to the Long 19th Amendment Project steering committee members who helped plan our Voting Matters Conference and then helped reframe it for this new virtual format. And of course, this series would not be possible without the tireless efforts of Becky Wasserman, Executive Director of Academic Ventures and Engagement, Jessica Vicklin, Director of Events, and their outstanding teams. Thank you. And finally, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our annual donors. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. Welcome once more, and now it's my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Jane Kamensky, who is the Forsheimer Foundation Director of the Sessinger Library here at Radcliffe, as well as the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History and Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's truly a thrill for my colleagues and me to be here with you on this centennial day. Schlesinger Library has been thinking about this anniversary for a long time. Um, in some ways, since Women's Equality Day in the year 1943, when the library was founded with the Women's Suffrage Collection of Maud Wood Park Radcliffe College Class of 1898. We've been planning in earnest for the past four years, funded by a generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation with crucial support from Radcliffe Institute and Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Since today's theme is origins stories, and today's session marks the opening of our semester long series on gender and citizenship in the United States, I'm gonna offer a little origin story of my own. Schlesinger's long 19th Amendment project was born in 2016 in a conversation in my office with a researcher, Professor Corinne Field of University of Virginia, who came in to talk about how the library, with its preeminent archival collections on women's suffrage, might infuse this coming anniversary with meaning and purpose. Like any good grassroots organizer, Corey then helped rally key leaders the historian Susan Ware, who was working on a new book called Why They Marched, and Professor Lisa Tetro of Carnegie Mellon University, whose prize-winning book, The Myth of Seneca Falls, had exposed grave originary flaws in many conventional suffrage histories. Together, we decided that Schlesinger should concentrate its centennial energies on supporting the kinds of scholarship that could transform the history of gender and American voting rights. 
setting the year 1920 in a broader span of time, a wider and more complex geography, and within a more capacious matrix of citizenship struggles. We would underwrite scholars asking questions that would yield fresh histories and fresh histories now and over the coming decades of research so that by the sesquicentennial in 2070, may we all live to see it, we would be reading something quite different. We would serve up Schlesinger Library's collections for the common good as we are through our open access portal, which formally opened yesterday. And I know that address will be pushed out to you in the chat. We would interrogate the archive as well, attending to its silences and omissions and thinking about how best to speak into them. Mellon Foundation's support has since allowed us to sponsor year long fellows, summer residencies for teachers and public historians, as well as scholars, a digital humanist to superintend our portal, innovative courses at Harvard College, exhibitions, and now finally this conference, starting with today's keynote address by Martha S. Jones, who is Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins. Jones is a preeminent historian of American law and especially of United States citizenship. Next month, she will publish the book Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. Vanguard is a fitting title since Jones's own work represents the vanguard of a new wave of history that I think exemplifies a core commitment of Schlesinger's Long 19th Amendment project, not just to tear down older exclusionary origin stories, but to actually build truer, more plural, and more variegated histories of women and the work of American citizenship, work that included, but has never been limited to, obtaining and exercising the vote. I want to close with a round of thanks that will surely leave important people out, for which I apologize. Thanks to the Mellon Foundation, of course, to the original three stars on our suffrage flag, Corey, Lisa, and Susan, to the staff of Schlesinger Library, nearly every one of whom has worked on this project over the last four years, and especially to the digital team led by Jen Weintraub, the research services team led by Ellen Shea, and Marilyn Dunn, without whom nothing would ever happen, period. To the members of the planning groups and the Harvard University Steering Committee for this project, all of whom are listed in the portal. To the students from Harvard College and from Cambridge Ridge and Latin High School who worked with the Long 19th this summer. To the supporters whose generosity has amplified the reach of this project in many directions. And finally, to my Radcliffe colleagues, including Deans Lizbeth Cohen and Tamiko Brown Nagan, and especially to Rebecca Wasserman and Jessica Vickland, who together with their staffs help us, helped us manage this complicated pivot to the virtual. So finally, enough preface. It is my pleasure now to pass the virtual floor to Professor Martha Jones. Her formal remarks will be followed by a conversation between her and Professor Lisa Tetro, after which Professor Tetro will moderate questions from the audience. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature on your Zoom to submit questions at any point during the discussion, um, remembering that keeping your questions short will increase the likelihood that the speakers will have the chance to address as many as possible in the time we have. So thank you and over to you, Martha. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Greenport, New York, and I'm really honored at, for the opportunity to um, be together uh, virtually um, and to get this extraordinary series of conversations, um, voting matters, um, underway. So thank you to uh, Dean Tomiko Brown Nagin, uh, to Professor Jane Kamensky, um, to Professor Lisa Tetro, who will join us a bit later. And of course, thank you to the Radcliffe Institute and the Schlesinger Library. This is an extraordinary undertaking, and I'm incredibly honored to be a part of it. My charge was to talk 
uh, is to talk about origin stories. And there is, I think, a gentle fallacy in the notion of origins. Um, as historians, uh, we must begin somewhere, and still sometimes it seems we might begin anywhere. And as my friend and colleague Lisa Tetro has frequently insisted, there are many, perhaps even countless origin stories when it comes to the history of the 19th Amendment and women's votes. And still, we have to start somewhere. For me, in the writing of the history of Black American women and voting rights, the place to begin is with ideas. I knew that over time, the women I write about came to think, organize, and work toward political rights through a specific set of ideas, a critique, in fact, one that insisted that neither race nor sex had any legitimate place in arbitrating rights and power, including access to the ballot. It is a facet of their political philosophy. While not unique to Black women, it is one that binds them together and helps us to recognize their distinct contribution to debates that began in the early 19th century, debates that we might say continue even until today. So my work begins with Black women as thinkers, as producers of ideas, as intellectuals, and even, we might say, political philosophers. They ask questions about equality, dignity, and human rights, and answer them with a bold claim. When they, as Black women in the United States, arrive at these ends, the entire nation will have arrived with them. In my story, these ideas begin with a woman named Jarena Lee, an itinerant Black Methodist preacher of the early 19th century. Now, church might be an odd or unexpected place to begin a story about the 19th Amendment, and still, Lee's contributions, her ideas, and the movement that she ignited among Black Methodist women was one of those essential starting places for understanding as we say, what comes next. What begins as the sing singular reflections of a remarkable woman lead us to a thread of ideas that mix with activism, all of which fuel Black women's road to voting rights. Theirs is a story that defied the often invoked sacred secular divide. It situates Black women's struggles for votes and their voting rights squarely in an institutional and cultural space that they shared with men. It is one key to understanding how it was that suffrage associations were not an easy fit from the perspective of Black women. And when the Black women lay, woman lay activist Eliza Ann Gardner delivers the benediction at the opening of what becomes the National Association of Colored Women at the end of the 19th century, we understand better why Black women's ideas and their leadership, including their push for voting rights, found a home there. Jarena Lee did not initially intend to upend power in her church. As a young woman, she first asked questions about her spiritual mission, the genuineness of her calling, the correctness of her biblical interpretation, and her capacity to convert souls. And yet she could not pose such questions without also bumping into the limits that womanhood placed on her purpose. She underwent a conversion and arrived at a life-defining insight. She would give in to a calling from God and preach. Trouble arose, of course, when that divine purpose led Jarena to speak with authority on spiritual matters and do so in public. Jarena lived a humble early life. She was born in Cape May, New Jersey in 1783, just at the end of the American Revolution. She was bound out as a servant at a young age, just seven years old, robbing her of a childhood. Her liberation story began at the age of 21 when Jarena converted to Christianity. As an adult, she was free as an eager new Christian to experiment with what it meant to be spiritually unbound. Jarena struggled, and her trouble centered on the condition of her soul rather than on her status as a woman. Her religious journey went from self-doubt, despair, and contemplation of suicide to time spent searching for a home in the Presbyterian, Catholic, and Anglican faiths. Finally, she was moved to conversion in Philadelphia's young African Methodist Episcopal Church. Signs that Jarena would not be a conventional adherent to the faith surfaced early on, first in her exuberant worship style, one that mixed prayer with passionate tears and even fevers, and then in her striving for sanctification, a perfection on earth that went beyond traditional Methodist teachings. Jarena was, from the start, ambitious, even excessive. 
1811, four or five years after joining the AME Church, Dorina distinctly heard and most certainly understood, as she put it, a voice that insisted that she go preach the gospel. She wrestled with an urge to tell her local minister, Richard Allen, of her calling, but then hesitated, a sign of just how inflammatory her ambition was. Not the first woman to speak publicly about the scriptures, she was among the very first to seek the formal approval of her church. Thus began a many decades long fight for Jarena, and the stakes were high. The AME church was navigating a delicate separation from the white-led Methodist Episcopal Church, which refused to ordain black ministers and bishops and refused to transfer the ownership of church property to black congregations. Allen, leader of Jarena's local congregation, would go on to become the sex head bishop. He was an experienced minister committed to safeguarding the future of his religious community. Was Jarena a preaching woman an asset or a threat to this new black Methodism? Allen initially tried to duck the question, doubting that Jarena's call was genuine. The two went back and forth privately. Allen valued her talents, but he doubted that church law permitted him to license her as a preacher. He hoped that Jarena would accept a more limited role in which she preached occasionally with the permission of a local minister. Jarena tried to live within the bounds of this compromise. She married an AME minister, and then six years into their marriage, Lee's husband died. Although she suffered, she was also free to return to the spiritual fire that had been suppressed when she played the ill-suited role of minister's wife. Lee returned to Philadelphia in Bishop Allen's sanctuary and hoped to find a middle ground. All that changed, though not exactly by design, when Lee attended the sermon of a guest minister who, at one moment, seemed to have lost the spirit. He faltered. Lee, in turn, sprang to action, moved by, as she put it, supernatural impulse to her feet. She then, standing in the pew, delivered an impromptu sermon that explained how she, like the Bible's Jonah, had been kept away from her true calling. As Lee sat down, Alan rose and declared that her call to preach was as genuine as that of any male minister present. That day launched Lee's preaching career. Over the next 30 years, she measured her efforts by miles traveled and sermons delivered. In 1827, for example, she covered 2,325 miles and delivered 178 sermons. Ten years later, in 1837, she preached 146 times and rode just shy of 1,000 miles. She was nothing short of tireless, but she also had to be fearless, especially when journeying alone. Lee regularly provoked a question, did a woman have the right to preach? Troubles surfaced in Salem, West Jersey, from the elder who, like many others, was averse to a woman's preaching. In nearby Woodstown, a church elder said he did not believe that ever a soul was converted under the preaching of a woman. And yet, when Lee's visit finished, the two shook hands in a concession of sorts. In Milford, Maryland, she arrived by invitation, knowing that preaching women had already generated objections there. In Reading, Pennsylvania, Lee encountered the Reverend James Ward, who was so prejudiced that he would not let me speak in the pulpit, she reported. Ward was later, according to Lee, rightly turned out of the church. In Princeton, New Jersey, local ministers banded together to stop her from preaching there altogether. A woman's right to preach turned out to be more than incidental to Lee's work. Her rights as a woman fused with her divine calling. Lee briefly stepped away from the pulpit in the 1830s, just long enough to put pen to paper. What emerged was one part hard learned lessons and one part manifesto on church women's power. In 1836, the first edition of her spiritual memoir, Religious Experience and Journal of Mrs. Jarena Lee appeared. She put the question plainly, why should it be thought impossible, heterodox, or improper for a woman to preach? The answer, in her view, lay not with men, but instead with the wonder of the divine in the un and the unequivocal authority of the Bible, she wrote. For as unseemly as it may appear nowadays for a woman to preach, it should be remembered that nothing is impossible with God. Did not Mary, a woman, preach the gospel? Lee explained, I have frequently found families who told me that they had not for several years been to a meeting, and yet when listening to hear what God would say by his poor colored female instrument, have believed with trembling, tears rolling down their cheeks, 
the signs of contrition and repentance towards God. Lee's moving successes demonstrated that women could transform the lives of individual believers. Do they also have the power to alter the institutions they called home? The framing of Lee's tract suggested yes, and its pages circulated along with their author from churches to revivals and camp meetings. The rights of women preachers were women's rights. By the 1840s, preaching women no longer toiled as solitary figures as had Jarena Lee. Around her grew up a sisterhood that included church women, lame women, um, and their concerns soon became her, her, excuse me, her concerns soon became theirs. Members of groups calling themselves the Daughters of Zion and the Daughters of Conference came to church politics by way of conventional routes, starting out as help meets to men who expected to steer religious life and then challenge the limits placed upon them in those circles. Their work required organizing, subterfuge, alliances with men sympathetic to their cause. Black churchwomen knew that when they invoked rights above all else, they were aiming to break men's monopoly on the pulpit. But in the spring of 1844, the Daughters of Zion faced a problem. They planned to attend that year's AME Church General Conference and the women knew that church rituals invited them in, but also kept them silent. If they wanted to be heard, they needed a strategy. Perhaps they conspired beforehand, or maybe they hatched a plan only after arriving in Pittsburgh for the conference. Banded together, women in the AME church prepared to fight for the right to have preaching licenses, how to accomplish that in the face of the 68 ministerial delegates who had no intention of listening to them at all, the challenge demanded ingenuity, and the women devised a scheme that promised to be controversial. The Daughters of Conference approached the Reverend Dr. Nathan Ward, a missionary delegate and founding member of the church's Indiana Conference, and proposed that he act as their spokesperson. They handed him ammunition, a petition. At the conference, Rose, Ward rose before the dozens of men delegates. Looking on was itinerant preacher Julia Foote, who later described the mayhem that erupted. This caused quite a sensation, bringing many members to their feet at once. They all talked and screamed to the bishop who could scarcely keep order. The conference was so incensed at the brother who offered the petition that they threatened to take action against him. The women's demands were explosive and the resolution failed. Still, the church women put the leadership on notice that they had organized as a sisterhood. And if the results of the 18, 1844 meeting discouraged them, the Daughters of Conference gave no sign of it. Over the next four years, they prepared to continue the battle. By 1848, the general conference scene had grown only more intimidating. Women gathered in the hallways and on the periphery of the conference chamber. There, they observed men, the leadership of a burgeoning denomination that came from 14 states, 175 officials, 375 lay leaders. The, the agenda was ambitious. It included electing a bishop, structuring the church missionary society, establishing a book depository, planning for common schools, and enacting sanctions for divorce and remarriage. To get on the agenda, the daughters again needed an ally, and Philadelphia's J.J. Gould Bias, an abolitionist, could be trusted to speak for the women. The deliberations that followed haven't survived, but the, round, the record does show that the daughters scored a victory. The leadership agreed to their demand for women's preaching licenses. Going forward, women like Jarena Lee would not need to broker special deals before commanding the pulpit. There was, however, opposition, and a rebuttal later surfaced, making clear that the war over church women's power was not over. Daniel Payne, a brilliant and ambitious Baltimore-based minister, warned that women's licenses were, quote, calculated to break up the sacred relations which women bear to their husbands and children and would lead to the utter neglect of their household duties and obligations. Payne made a record of his objections, but in 1848, church women's rights moved forward. Only a few months after AME church women scored a first victory for their rights, women in Seneca Falls, New York gathered, and there they too set forth a demand for church women's rights. 
the Declaration of Sentiments criticized thinking that deprived women of preaching licenses. He allows her in church as well as state, but in a subordinate position, claiming apostolic authority for her exclusion from the ministry and with some exceptions from any participation in the affairs of the church. The meeting's final resolutions included a demand that spoke to the right to preach from the pulpit. Resolved, it is preeminently his duty to encourage her to speak and teach as she has an opportunity in all religious assemblies. Black and white women, even in 1848, shared a criticism of how men dominated their faith communities, but how they organized already differed. In early Reconstruction, at the very moment that the American Equal Rights Association was debating the terms of the 14th and 15th Amendments, Black Methodist women returned to debates about their rights. Again, these were debates that echoed those swirling through the politics of civil society. In the AME Zion Church, Eliza Ann Gardner led the way. She had come of age in Boston in the decades before the Civil War, raised in an activist household. Whether she was eavesdropping while perched on the edge of a settee, pouring cups of tea, lost with her nose in the pages of the Liberator, or at attention during a church or, uh, or political meeting, Eliza came to know many of the era's radical luminaries. Thinkers from William Lloyd Garrison, John Brown, and Frederick Douglass to Sojourner Truth and Charles Sumner stretched her horizons across the endless miles of the lecture circuit. These were lessons in politics that no primer taught. By the 1870s, Gardner was often dubbed the Julia Ward Howe of her race, a compliment to the strength of her commitments, anti-slavery and women's suffrage, were interests Gardner shared with Howe, a white Bostonian. Gardner, however, centered her activism in a spiritual home, the AME Zion Church. Gardner was ready to directly address church women's rights, and this turn was no happenstance. She was a student of history and knew that since the 1840s, Black Methodist women had been demanding and for a brief time had even won the right to preaching licenses. Something new was in the air, however, and it was talk of women's suffrage. During the 1860s, Gardner had witnessed how abolitionists and women's rights allied had clashed over women's voting rights in the American Equal Rights Association at home in Massachusetts, she had seen Black women activists, along with the Republican Party and State House leadership, put women's suffrage on the agenda, only to fail. At the podium, Gardner never failed to put women's concerns first. Quote, our fathers and mothers, too, fought to secure the glorious boon of liberty, Gardner admonished those who assembled in Boston at the 1876 centennial celebration of the Declaration of Independence. The emphasis is hers. Women's fundraising, she believed, was a key to their power. And Gardner's remarks came along with a $100 contribution on behalf of the Ladies Charitable Association, a society composed of colored women. As if to underscore the women's political savvy, she emphasized that they had voted to assist the Centennial Committee, operating by political, even democratic principles. Then came the bargain. Quote, we have made this effort for more than one reason, she explained. Black women had been among the nation's founders and are American citizens, all attempts to waive our claims to that title to the contrary notwithstanding. Gardner hoped to be thanked for the women's gift and then expected to be fully recognized as a rights-bearing person. Had they been listening, leaders of the AME Zion Church would have done well to take heed. Gardner was coming next for them. As far back as 1868, the Sisters of Zion, women of Gardner's Boston congregation, had turned to the matter of church law, the doctrines and discipline. They began by giving it a close, careful read. Sexism, they discovered, was baked into the foundation of their denomination. So the women got to work demanding that terms like man and male be purged from the law. In anticipation of an upcoming general conference, they drafted a request that the church's governing body remove all words, etc., from the discipline of our church, which prohibit females from having the same rights and privileges as male members. It was a request made respectfully, but unequivocally. Women like Gardner expected to have the same rights as their fathers and husbands. The general conference did as asked, and the law was changed. For Gardner's and Zion's church women, it was a first victory, but they were not done. The women formulated a next set of demands that included a call for the right to hold office, and again they won. The church created the office of the deaconess, a team of women lay leaders. 
Soon women began appearing in church conferences as delegates representing the men and women of their state or region. They took seats as decision makers. Hundreds gathered to debate the church's future, engaged in lawmaking, and otherwise directed AME Zion's governance. It was a sea change. Soon women preachers again received licenses as part of ordinary business, and few objected when a woman stepped into the pulpit to interpret the scripture. Women petitioned for control of their missionary work and won a new ladies' home and foreign missionary society where they controlled the direction of benevolent work. Eliza Gardner urged Zionites to view women ministers in the long history of their church. It has been 100 years of joy and sorrow, labor, conflict, and triumph. The century has witnessed the emancipation of man and the almost severed bonds of woman. Tis glorious though that this grand old church is the first religious organization to accord to women the same rights she accords to men, the sterner sex. Gardner led by a style that mixed directness with wit. She won over both men and women in an appeal to equality in AME Zion. The key to her success lay in the terms of a bargain in which women leveraged their labor to win power. She wrote, if you will not try to do by us the best you can, you will strengthen our efforts and make us a power. But if you commence to talk about the superiority of men, if you persist in telling us that after the fall of man, we were put under your feet and that we are intended to be subject to your will, we cannot help you. By 1898, the AME Zion Church stood out among Methodists and among Protestant sects generally by ordaining its first women to the ministry. By the time women were ordained in this church, it was, of course, the advent of the era of Jim Crow. And the concerns of racism met the concerns about sexism that had long animated Eliza Ann Gardner's public career. In 1895, Gardner was among the Black women leaders who convened a first meeting of the National Association of Colored Women. It was the birth of a movement that would mobilize Black women's power for decades to come. Gardner was singled out for leadership, a recognition of her years championing women's rights in the church. The conventions desig designated her its chaplain. Gardner provided the opening and closing prayers at the very first meeting. She was a force behind the founding of another Black women's movement, one that combined their energies to tackle national problems under the motto, lifting as we climb. When in 1899, Eliza Ann Gardner signed a letter, yours for Zion and the complete redemption of women everywhere, she expressed a political philosophy in which the struggle for the rights of church women was one facet of a fight for women's rights everywhere. AME Zion activist women moved nimbly between sacred and secular circles, cross-fertilizing each with ideas about their rights, including their capacities to vote and hold office. These were not women who made stark choices between the pulpit and a temperance hall or between missionary society fundraising and a club movement convention. Just as political debates, in, debates informed their religious deliberations, women's work in churches was a route to rights consciousness, an occasion for honing arguments and a proving ground for their capacities for leadership, governance, and even political wrangling. In this, there was power. On the road to the 19th Amendment, and then on through the long struggle to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, church women like Jarena Lee and Eliza Ann Gardner showed a way. They developed and refined ideas. They tested them and made them do work in Black Methodist churches where power mattered for the well-being of all Black Americans. In 1920, Hallie Quinn Brown headed the National Association of Colored Women. She faced the arduous task of now defeating Jim Crow through winning federal legislation that would guarantee the vote to those Black women, too many Black women who remained disenfranchised despite a 19th Amendment. Brown would try first to build an alliance with the National Women's Party, and when rebuffed, the NACW joined with civil rights organizations in a new campaign for women's and men's votes. Hallie Quinn Brown had been an educator, and Chautauqua trained elocutionist before assuming the helm of the NACW, but her political career had begun elsewhere, in the AME Church. 
Give her your votes, insisted Gertrude Bustle Moselle, referring to Brown in 1892. Moselle admonished those men who saw Brown's womanhood as a bar to her holding the office of Secretary of Education in the AME Church. Let the sex have its representation, for we all know they willingly accept more than their share of the taxation. With that, a run for office, Brown was baptized into women's politics, part of a maelstrom in which, alongside her, other church women claimed the right to hold office as ordained ministers. Moselle's ideas and the political savvy that it took to further them in church were what brought Brown to the NACW and the long struggle for Black women's votes. It was a debt she owed, in part, of course, to Jarena Lee. And with that, I'm now delighted to invite us, uh, to invite Lisa Tetro to join me um, for a discussion. Thanks so much, Lisa, for um, being a part of this occasion. Thank you so much, Martha, for being a part of this occasion. Um, and thanks to all of you who've joined us. And thank you particularly, Martha, for this um, forthcoming work and for the intervention that you've been um, so busily uh, putting into the centennial and helping us all understand different ways to narrate this campaign. It's been absolutely instrumental, I think, in this particular moment. Um, and I, like many, are waiting with uh, great anticipation for the publication of Vanguard next month. Um, how you went about writing this story uh, in terms of reading the archive against the grain, because of course many of the women you speak of are not going to show up in suffrage collections per se. And in some ways that origin story that we've had of 1848 to 1920 has so slanted both the construction of the archive and the labeling of the archive that those have been the stories that have most been readily found, whereas the stories you're telling us are coming from elsewhere in the archives. And I wondered if you want to take a minute to talk about um, the archives and how we need to be mindful about how we use the archives when we try to recover these stories. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I have to begin by um, paying tribute to uh, Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn and her pioneering work um, uh, that is um, the foundation for um, so much of what I write. Um, and I point to that to say um, I came of age um, as a historian at, time, at a time when um, I could ven benefit um, from women who are already modeling for us what it meant to challenge um, stock narratives, what it meant to think ambitiously and in alternative ways about the archive. When Dr. Turborg Penn rereads the history of women's suffrage um, and then discovers, rediscovers, surfaces, and helps us think critically about the places that Black women occupy and do not occupy in that story, um, I am taking very much um, uh, her lead and, um, and running with it here. Um, but it became apparent to me that um, there was a misunderstanding that I think still was lurking when I began my work, which is that somehow Black women had um, been uh, uh, less interested, perhaps uninterested in um, problems of sex and gender, um, and that they had um, leaned toward and committed their efforts to um, problems of race and racism. Um, but for me, um, if I was a skeptic, what to do about the skepticism, um, I had to follow Black women where they were. And that's how I come to someone like Jarena Lee, um, that if I kept uh, mining the women's conventions or later the women's suffrage associations, I would be in a sense disappointed because I would not find important numbers of black women there. Um, but I knew that there were many, many more black women activists um, in all of these periods. So where were they? Um, and church is one answer to that. And um, that leads me down a road to reading a different kind of archive um, with the sorts of questions we had asked of suffrage collections. Um, where are women? What are they talking about? What kind of critiques are they developing? What kind of activism are they engaged in? Um, and frankly, the first time I encounter someone like Eliza Ann Gardner, I'm flabbergasted um, in part because her ideas are so directly resonant with what I knew was being talked about in 
um, women's organizations and in suffrage associations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so here we are in the centennial of the vote um, and you are giving us this alternate um, development of a women's political sphere, a women's political philosophy, a women's political culture. Uh, and I wondered if you wanted to speak some to how you feel that ends up undergirding and uh, informing and, and positioning itself with a voting demand. Um, you know, one of the things that I feel like is happening is that we've had this tight conflation for a long time between women's rights and the vote as being synonymous in some ways, which is in part part of the myth of Seneca Falls. And this is now being uncoupled um, in useful ways, but then also reconfigured in new and different ways. And I wondered if you wanted to speak to how you are trying to encourage us to reconfigure our thinking around the, the positioning of those different issues in time and space. Um, I think that um, this is why a figure like Eliza Ann Gardner is so critical um, to my analysis, um, that uh, Gardner is someone who um, takes us, if you will, from many, many decades of activism centered in churches and shows us how both the women of churches, but also the ideas that they have um, refined in churches um, move into the realm of politics in that moment when she helps to found uh, the National Association of Colored Women. The National Association of Colored Women is essential. It's, it's not an accident that it's founded in the 1890s on part because this is now the um, period where we have the advent of Jim Crow and Black women band together to challenge Jim Crow. But I see the NACW as 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 near as black women get to founding a suffrage association. Right? Yeah. This is the place where tens and then hundreds of thousands of black women will come together to advocate for women's votes. Yes, this is the organization that Mary Church Terrell um, will head and work through for a very long time. Um, and at the same time, this is an organization that um, builds on the leadership of someone like Hallie Quinn Brown, who cuts her teeth in church and then moves into the secular realm. Um, and still, um, this is ne a necessary configuration because Black women aren't going to work singularly um, or exclusively on voting rights. They are going to couple their suffrage activity with, for example, advocacy for anti-lynching legislation, which is another essential piece of the puzzle. So for me, um, and of course I had you and, and our conversations in mind as I was um, working through this talk, um, it felt important to um, demonstrate the, the, the literal connections and not just the figurative or, you know, loose uh, figuration of ideas, but actually to show that there are women like Hallie Quinn Brown, like Eliza Ann Gardner, who are moving from church into the politics of the NACW and become suffragists um, in a much more discernible sense. Um, for me, there's no mistaking how what they learn, um, what they do, um, who they are, how they organize in church um, is fueling the way they make they do work that is much more expressly political. Yeah, and I'll just say this by as a kind of transition to the audience. I've also heard you say elsewhere that when um, Black women's advocacy for the vote um, surfaces as well and where it's positioned, it's undergirded by a very different political philosophy in a way. And part of what I see your work doing as well is helping us understand that when we're talking about advocating for the vote in one context and another, we're not necessarily talking about the same thing. Um, and so um, I've also so appreciated how you've helped us think about the different ways in which political traditions inform that demand. Um, and that has been, um, I think, such a helpful piece. Also to remind us not only that the who is different, but the, the pursuit, that the, the goal is actually different. Um, and I think we sometimes homogenize that goal in a way that um, also oversimplifies, I think, the kind of harmony around that particular subject. Um, okay, so um, uh, why don't we move to the audience, um, although I would love to talk with you for an additional hour and a half. Um, we'll have time to do that after this is all over. Um, 
there are a variety of questions coming in. Um, and one of them I imagine is on uh, many people's minds um, because what you've done here in this talk and in much of your work is pivot us away from the familiar terrain of abolition uh, and pivot us away from black women's organizing in abolition and co-organizing with white women and pivoted us toward this faith tradition and this work inside churches. And people are asking, where would you position the story of abolition and women's activism in abolition within this longer strain of Black women's political philosophy? Thank you. Um, I think Jarena Lee is really um, a, a precursor right, to um, the, uh, the emergence of an abolitionist movement and um, Black women's um, abolitionist activism. Um, but abolitionism is not a, a substitute, I don't think, for um, church activism for the women um, mm -hmm. about whom I write. Um, and again, while there will be important numbers of black women in the abolitionist movement, um, if we went, um, you know, head for head, um, the black Methodist churches um, are, are far more, um, uh, women are far more numerous there than they are in the anti-slavery movement. So that's one answer. Um, but it's also true that um, I write about Hester Lane, who in 1840 has been an important New York-based um, Black woman abolitionist, someone with political ambitions, um, wants to become part of the leadership um, of the American Anti-Slavery Society um, in those uh, critical years when um, the society would become fractured precisely over the elevation of women to leadership. In that very fateful meeting in 1840, when um, some women, white women, do in indeed join the leadership ranks, um, uh, Lane is defeated and confronts a sort of glass ceiling um, in the American anti-slavery society. So that even when we look at black women in abolitionism, we discover that um, they confront um, limitations on their ability to win influence and authority to hold office. Um, and so um, the story of abolitionism is also um, an uneven one for African-American women. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are other questions coming in about the, the church world and the sacred, um, including how would women uh, within that universe have understood the difference between sort of the sacred and the civic um, and um, using voting and using, um, you know, a religious voice and understood the connections between those two um, traditions and, you know, even whether they would have understood them as different. Um, Sure. Um, so how does faith then, you know, inform one's political standing? Mm -hmm. Well, in the example of Jarena Lee, I think you can hear the way in which faith and this, her resolute sense that she's called by God um, gives her a kind of spine, right? Um, and a, um, a foundation for her persistence um, in the face of a great deal of opposition. So I think that's one way to think about how faith um, works. But, you know, Black Methodism, like all American Methodism, is a profoundly um, simultaneously hierarchical and democratic um, denomination and works by way of a hierarchy and at the same time by these general conferences where folks vote, um, they elect bishops, they vote on changes to church law. Um, so um, in some ways, I think um, the women I write about see structurally the ways in which um, this mirrors, for example, the kinds of structures and proceedings in um, things like the colored convention movement, which is sim going running simultaneously. And at the same time, I guess it's important to reiterate that um, African American churches, now this is something we know, I think, almost intuitively, not intuitively, we know reflexively um, about the modern civil rights era, but it is as true, if not more true, um, in the 19th century that black churches are far more than sites of spiritual contemplation or refuge. These are the central, um, if you will, civic organizations in African American communities um, where folks are pouring in meager resources, um, yes, for the purposes of worship, but also for the purposes of education, um, for benevolent work and relief, um, and a great self-defense and a great deal more. Um, mm -hmm. So that when we talk about the politics of 
Black Methodism, for example, and of course, Evelyn Higginbotham has written about this so importantly um, and informs my work so deeply in the context of um, Black Baptists, um, there is a great deal more to church than um, the sacred. Um, this, there is a great deal that is we might regard as secular, that divide doesn't really um, hold, I don't think, for the scenes that I'm drawing. Yeah. Uh, more questions are coming in about archives and people would like to know, um, where did you discover these women? What archives did you use? Um, talk more about the, the nitty gritty of, of diving into these records and where are they kept? How are they kept? Um, you know, what's missing from the records? All those things. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, one of the things, especially for this early period, that was critical um, and it's important to acknowledge is that women like Jarena Lee leave their own record for us. Lee takes time out from this very important work that she does to pen a memoir, a spiritual memoir, in the great tradition of, of Christian um, memoir writing. Um, but she pens that and leaves it certainly for those who follow her, those who are inspired her to understand her story better. She publishes it and it is a way to earn money on the um, on the preaching circuit, um, but she leaves it also for us so that we can recover um, her ideas. And so um, again and again um, in this early period, um, I rely very much on the um, insistence um, by um, some remarkable black women um, that their work, their lives, their ideas um, not only should animate their moment, but should become part of a record. Now we know, um, and of course you have taught us um, all that all the nuance we needed to know about um, uh, a, a collection like the history of women's suffrage, right? Six volumes, thousands of pages. Black women don't quite engage in projects that are quite that ambitious or heavy handed. Um, but they share the sense that we are women of consequence and we are going to leave a record. I write about Maria Miller Stewart, the first uh, American woman, it is thought, to have stood at a podium, spoken to a mixed audience about politics. Her speeches are published in William, Lloyd's Gar uh, William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator um, and in her own pamphlet. Um, and so I depend very much on the women themselves. Um, and then the few repositories um, that even early on valued and um, safeguarded and maintained those materials um, for us. I, re I rely on um, folks like historians like Marilyn Richardson, who, you know, gosh, it's almost 40 years ago, um, at least 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago, collects Maria, Mariah Stewart's writings um, and publishes them for us. Um, so it's to say, in some ways, this work has been going on a very long time. And as we say, uh, Vanguard stands on the shoulders um, of many, many, many generations of women. I also think of um, the churches that you're talking about as repositories themselves, right? Having been in some ways the archives, the political space for the secular space for the communal space for so many communities. I'm thinking of other historians work who say, you know, I went into the AME Zion church and opened, you know, this closet and they're suddenly, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, shout out to Dennis, Dick Dennis Dickerson, who was for many years the bibliographer of the AME church and invited me to Nashville um, to take a seat at the working table in his office and go through his personal library. Um, so there is that, right, um, about the story of who safeguards things and why. And for Dickerson, he, was, he is a historian um, in his own right, but he was also the, the, the safeguarded the records of the church. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Martha. I wish we had far more time, um, but I encourage everyone to get their hands on Vanguard and um, uh, Professor Jones has also been the busiest uh, uh, superstar of the Centennials, so um, you can find her talks and um, many radio and things um, out there in the blogosphere now that we're all home and looking for um, things to watch since we've all finished Netflix. Um, so um, I will now um, pass the floor back over to Jane Kamensky um, for some closing remarks and um, also 
close with my own thanks to Jane for um, for shepherding this entire project along, for creating this space for us to both fund the creation of new work, to shepherd an archive that continues to work against the grain so that we can continue to challenge these stories, and also for um, putting on this conference to try to bring together people not usually in dialogue and um, bring us together with a broader community. So, um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, over to Jane. Thank you, Martha and Lisa, both so much for that um, reframing beginning, which I think will carry with us through the sessions for the rest of this semester. Um, I'm particularly grateful for and humbled, Martha, by your comments about the, the many kinds of institutions that do the work of collecting important archives um, that can help document broader stories and um, for the need for an institution like Schles Schlesinger to exist in conversation and in partnership um, with those differently missioned institutions who have had um, eyes on where we had blinders for many decades. Um, so uh, also important to think about going forward. Um, thank you everybody for being here today with Lisa and Martha in this conversation on origin stories. Um, I hope you'll be able to participate in the continuation of our virtual conference, Voting Matters, Gender Citizenship and the Long 19th Amendment. Um, please mark your calendar for the next installment, Reconstructing the Polity on Thursday, September 17th at 4 p.m., um, where we'll explore uh, voting rights, citizenship rights more broadly in the immediate post-Civil War period, um, and in particular, particular in the wake of the adoption of the 15th Amendment in 1870. Um, a full list of all of the sessions will appear on your screen as soon as I get blanked out um, and can also be found on Radcliffe's website. Um, thank you all and have a great rest of your afternoon. Cheers.